Ah, there we are. <laughs> hey there, everybody. This is round two of one of the more uh, rough around the edges episodes of a uh, a podcast of a, a kind of a regular video um, uh, element that we want to keep putting out. That's Carolyn Baker and myself. I'm Dean Walker. And this is the Poetry of Predicament podcast, and God knows if it's going to go out on the uh, Impossible Conversation podcast, and it might even end up on the new Lifeboat Hour. Who knows? <laughs> In any case, what we're doing is with these particular uh, expressions in uh, the spring of 2018, this is in the first week of June 2018, that this particular episode two is coming out. We're recalling about a week ago, we put out the first one, which is about uh, primarily Rex Tillerson was the, the star of the show, and uh, deep irony and uh, just deep tragic irony of our situation with regard to both gaslighting and mind fucking. So the, it, that fit the title pretty darn well last week. If you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend it. It's, um, it's breathtaking. So what we're doing is we're kind of recapping uh, the last week's updates, and that's about all we can do is take a week at a time, because if we, if we wait too much longer than that, we have too many incidents of gaslighting and mindfucking to try and fit into a, a short show like this. So, um, Carolyn, I think you and I, just before we started recording, um, you were mentioning some of the news from yesterday. Would you talk about the uh, Merkley situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we were talking about early on is that, um, as many people know, uh, ICE, Border Patrol, are ripping migrant children away from their parents and separating them in a separate detention for kids. And um, there are several thousand of these kids now that are in detention centers, separated from their parents, and neither parents nor children know when they might get back together again. It could take years. And some psychologists that I have been listening to have been talking about how traumatic that is, how, how, what, how devastating that is for the young child's brain and that it's a scar for life kind of thing. They, they never really get over that. So yesterday, uh, Oregon Center Jeff Merkley went to one of these detention centers for children, uh, which is, used to be a Walmart in Brownsville, Texas, right on the Mexican border, and wanted to get in and see the situation with these kids, and ICE would not allow him in. So when you have thousands of kids ripped away from their parents. And many of these people are just trying to get asylum in the United States. It's not like they were out wandering around and just decided to come here. They've got papers, they've got documents, they're prepared to present those uh, to the authorities. And yet their parents are detained, children are detained, but separately. And a United States Senator cannot even get in to see what's going on in one of these facilities. Um, if that doesn't send chills up and down your spine, I encourage you to check your vital signs because this is a huge red flag of an authoritarian autocratic society. And that's where we're heading because we've lost our sense of agency. And that's one thing we're gonna talk about today. Yeah, Carolyn, there are a couple of directions I wanna go. Uh, in, sure. in a few minutes, I'd like to talk about how we're normalizing an extraordinary level of trauma in our own systems daily. Yeah. We'll get to there. You, you were just talking about the re relationship that we have with the rule of law and also that sense of agency that we've forfeited in order to be able to be a part of this business as usual structure. Right. Um, that happened quite a while ago, I'm, I assert. And um, what, what seems to have happened just in this past year and a half in this extraordinary Trump-filled environment is that we have had to somehow get our, get our heads around uh, the leader of the free world the, in the most powerful position in the world is pres president of the United States. 
uh, being able to just literally step on, stomp on the rule of law and to flout it. So I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that in terms of not just the, the ICE situation, which really just takes my breath away when a congressman is turned away by a military organization of our own country. That's a whole other story. But can you speak a little bit about what you're seeing with that, that um, smashing of the rule of law through the um, executive branch? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, increasingly every week we see more and more um, naked assertion by the Trump administration that he is above the law. I mean, he's practically said those words. Um, he said that, you know, I'm a president so I can pardon myself. Richard Nixon, by the way, uh, made the statement after he resigned, if the president did it, then it's not illegal. Um, Trump it basically said the other day, or Rudy Giuliani speaking for Trump, said that Trump could shoot somebody and get away with it because he's the president. Um, even before Trump was elected, he made that statement, I could shoot somebody out on Fifth Avenue and my support would not go away. So increasingly every day we're seeing more and more assertions that the rule of law in this country is dead. And if Trump does get away with these numerous crimes for which he's being investigated, and it's not just the Russian election interference, it has to do with money laundering and corruption and a host of other crimes. If he's allowed to get away with these, then the rule of law in this country is dead. Some people would argue, well, it's been dead for a long time. I don't believe it's ever been this blatant. And then we just become another banana republic, another autocratic society. And what makes us different from what happened in Germany in the 1930s? I don't think you have to think about that a really long time. Yeah. So I'd like to just draw a little, little connection to last week's episode one of this uh, gaslighting and mind-fucking um, <laughs> series, and God knows how long this series will go. Maybe, maybe it'll be a while here. Um, last week, there, was a, there were a couple of outtakes, and I, I now regret uh, taking them out because um, they, they were basically articulating how... Um, when confronted, when uh, fossil fuel major corporations are confronted with regulation of nearly any kind, they uh, are uh, really apathetic. They don't have to care. They're too big to care. Right. They have too much power to care. And uh, one of the clips that I took out, which I guess I'll bring it back in in one of our later episodes, is uh, one in which George W. Bush, when asked, you know, why, why won't you uh, tell these guys what to do? Tell them that you want them to clean up the mess in this particular oil spill. He says, you don't tell these guys what to do. They don't get told what to do. That's the president of the United States a couple of uh, times back. Right. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And now we have the opposite. We have the President of the United States saying, I can tell you anything. You know, I can tell you anything. And, you know, he's, he's not going to tell the oil companies anything at the moment, and he's busy trying to bail out coal. Mm -hmm. But if push came to shove, he would say, I can tell you anything. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what I'm pointing to is really just above a certain threshold of wealth and power that you then have a, f a free ride ticket. You Absolutely. can basically call the shots and you can name the level at which you wanna play and name the amount of income and benefit that you wanna be able to reap from it. Right. Uh, and clearly that's what uh, Donald Trump is up to. So um, do we have, I, before we get back to the, the situation with the children and families and ICE, is are there any other <clears throat> are there any other uh, recent 
events that we should be including in this particular stripe of the conversation? Hmm. Well, I do know for sure that, um, you know, because in the Daily News Digest that I publish every day, I have a civil liberties and human rights section. And I track that all the time. And I can tell you that police brutality is so far off the charts than it has ever been in our country since, well, since the cracking of heads of immigrants and deportation of immigrants in the 1920s and 30s, um, and uh, the crashing of the labor movement and trying to shut that down. Um, we haven't seen this kind of police brutality in many, many decades. Um, and it's not just black people, although it, the, the majority of abuse is against African Americans and Hispanics, people of color. Um, but now we're seeing even uh, astonishing brutality uh, against Caucasians. Got it. Yeah. You know, I, th I think I want to um, just mention, plant a seed for perhaps it'll be our next episode of this. I. Uh, I want to mention that I'm I'm tracking uh, how Trump is loading the courts in an extraordinary way that um, tends to get lost in the dumpster fire smoke of the everyday occurrences of the of the news cycle. Um, there are dozens and dozens of very important judgeships across the country that are no less important than any political office mm -hmm. that one can imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, taken all together, they are uh, one of the greatest amplifiers and accelerators of the conservative agenda, the libertarian agenda that, um, that we've ever seen. And it's one part of a whole network of things going on behind the smoke screen that's going on. So again, we'll, we'll spend some time there. Is this a good time to uh, go back to that notion of, uh, of trauma and normalizing? Yes, of course. Yeah. I just, I just want to set a little context. Um, you know, one thing that you and I are including in our workshops uh, this year and, and the, uh, much of the online content as well is you know to really get into people's hands some some self-healing and self-assessing tools for just what exactly am i carrying how how is all this stuff mm -hmm. making a difference on my life and on my literally my body my system my emotional well-being my psychology uh, because truthfully i i don't know any other words for our situation that we're pointing at today than insanity. This is true, it's truly insane. Yes. And to try and imagine that we, at any level of this country, that there's anyone who's immune, that won't be getting it on them. Right. This, right. You know, it's, it's gonna get on us and it's gonna absorb into our system. It's, you know, every time we have a shock to our, political system, like we get the, what little bit of healthcare reform was eked out during the Obama administration to have it constantly attacked and attacked and attacked. They tried to repeal it hundreds of times mm -hmm. and then to be successful at doing that. And then the apparent shock, they just, oh gee, we never knew that this was actually gonna affect our healthcare. Mm -hmm that these these are all shocking to our system they're all trauma to our system and they layer upon layer in our system and we really have no facility we're not good at it in our culture to be able to uh see it in the first place and then to be able to articulate it and work on it in any way well, so I that, think one of the things if i could just say right here one of the things we have lost touch with is a sense of human rights. What are human rights? Well, the right to health care is one of those. And somewhere along the line, you know, it might have been with Rockefeller and his medicine men who basically uh, um, um, destroyed alternative medicine in this country for a while. Um, we've lost the sense of health care is a human right. 
We've lost a sense of water is a human right. We have the president of Nestle saying, water is a human right. We get to own it. We get to sell it to you for whatever price we want. Yeah. Or food or kindness and compassion or just a place to live where you're safe and you're not going to get beaten up or killed. You know, these are basic human rights. Uh, the right not to be raped. Yeah. The right not to be assaulted. We've lost complete touch with that. Yeah. So the what you and I are both saying here, and certainly what we're creating the safe container for in our workshops, is to be able to have people be able to just take a temperature, just stop mm -hmm. and slow down and really take the pulse of what's going on what impact is this having on each of us mm -hmm. i'd be willing to assert that one of the greatest costs of what you and i are talking about now why the whole why this whole gaslighting and mind fucking conversation is that we have obliterated the notion of trust in every dimension mm -hmm. so we are are strained to the to the max to be able to find even a small amount of trust in the people closest to us mm -hmm. because in every other dimension trust that which it takes to trust you know the idea of having honor and civility and uh respect for life mm -hmm. these elements as you were just saying are are either severely threatened or already gone. Right, and if you talk to anybody in my parents' generation um, who lived through the Great Depression, they will say, well, it used to be you made a deal with somebody and a handshake was good enough because people trusted each other in right. a very basic level. Why? Because we're all human beings, and so we trust each other. Yeah. You know, one, one part I'm, I'm starting up a, a second book as if the first one wasn't painful enough, but, but I'm going at it again. Well, I know that one. <laughs> yeah, I know, you know it many, many times over. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to cut this part out as actually, cause it just washed out of my brain. Okay. That would be a good idea. <laughs> oh, I know. I know what it is. Okay. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in taking a part of, of what we talk about in the workshops and, and putting it as clearly as I can in this next book. Mm -hmm. And that is what got us here yeah. to where to, you know, the environment is completely and utterly, you know, not looking good. It's <laughs> no matter how you measure it and our relationships with one another, this whole notion of the decimation of trust and on and on. And what got us here, is that we disconnected we've disconnected from our our own wiser selves we've disconnected from each other and we've disconnected from the earth and the cost of that is extraordinary it it gives us a blind spot if we've disconnected from those those primary sources of meaning in a human life that means we've left this gigantic blind spot where there used to be sensitivities, where there used to be a real discernment within us. And what will rush into that blind spot? Shadow. And I believe that that's what, that's what we're talking about, certainly in this series of gaslighting and mindfucking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, we have a collective shadow as well as an individual shadow. And uh, right now, that shadow is running the world. Yeah. So to, to loop it back to what you started us with, Carolyn, is, is you mentioned about this just incomprehensible situation with ICE taking families and separating them and then refusing access for a U.S. Um, representative to be able to confirm what's going on. And that this, um, I, would, I would really challenge anyone to come up with another word more appropriate than trauma. This is a way of traumatizing, obviously, the people involved 
whether they would agree with it or not, the guards, the, the administrators, the politicians, the lawmakers that are making that whole system happen, they, I, have, I would assert, are getting layered into their own system, meaning internal little physical and psychological system, trauma. Absolutely. And then we as other citizens in this country and people who just watching the news mm -hmm. are again getting layered yeah. with trauma. Absolutely. And this has now become part of the daily routine mm -hmm. that we have come to normalize. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, again, I emphasize people will say to me from time to time, well, I just can't watch the news. You know, it just it just upsets me too much. And then they they march off into the sunset as if, well, I'm fine. You know, I, I mean, I don't watch it. I don't listen to it. So I'm good. But in fact, as we said in the last episode, there is no way this is not affecting all of us whether we watch the news or not. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, I, it feels like we might be getting toward wrapping up here. And I, I would not feel right if I didn't include, um, you know, there, there are ways that, thank goodness, you and I have been exposed to in our lives, ways to keep our hearts open even in the face of this kind of atrocious occurrence. And I would wish that for us all, that we would build up our inner capacity and our inner toolkit to, you know, some of the words we often use is to be resilient, to find a way to be resilient instead of more discouraged and having a sense of completely lost our agency in life and our sense of purpose and meaning and dignity yeah. to be able to step in the other direction, the direction toward dignity, toward a, a mutual respect for life and interrelatedness yes. with life. I don't know about you, but that's why I'm doing this work that you and I are putting together. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, I want to reiterate, I don't know if I said this last time, but I'll probably say it many times. Um, we are headed for the collapse of industrial civilization. We have been for decades. We are headed for terrible climate catastrophe. And what I'm interested in is not preventing those things because they're not pre preventable. But what I am interested in is making the descent and the tumbling down over the cliff as humane and with the least brutality as possible. I'm interested in softening the blows. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how do we be kind to each other at this time? I was having lunch with a friend today and she's a 12 stepper, has been for decades. And she said, if there's nothing else I can do right now, except be kind, in this fascist leaning autocratic civilization that is falling apart and, you know everywhere um then that is a huge step if there's nothing else i can do but be kind mm -hmm. that's really well said i um it's it's one last thing <laughs> promise <laughs> yeah yeah um, there's a little bit of my heart breaks on top of all the stuff we're talking about. There's a little pocket that particularly uh, hurts when, it, when I'm aware of it, that I've been aware of the uh, past couple of weeks in particular, is I'm seeing so many folks that, that you and I know in the various circles of what we might call collapse aware people. You know, so we've got some knowledge and we've, we're, we've had our woke moment and, and we're doing our best. And we try to connect with other people. We've gotten a sense that, yeah, this is a good time to find allies. This is a good time to have our tribe and get people that 
you love and be around them. And what breaks my heart within that is how just because we have a little bit of knowledge about this, because we're a little bit more collapse aware than the average person, mm -hmm. it gives us absolutely no special agreement or arrangement to know how to be with one another in a different way. So the best we can do is in our saturated state, meaning we're saturated with this business as usual way that we're all taught to be in a predatory business as usual world where we're all separate. And what's been breaking my heart is these people just doing their best with a little bit of awakening and a little bit of heart and they come at each other with that kind of business as usual predatory judgment and so on even though they're supposedly allies and this so is the expansion. that's just a little sharing on my part it, it, what that does is inspire me to to bring the, some pieces we can work on together mm -hmm. in the workshops that we're going to be doing this year july and october and uh and offer those pieces up so that so people don't have to reinvent the damn wheel. Absolutely, I agree. I don't think we have time for that. We don't. Yeah. So Carolyn, thanks for this kind of freewheeling second episode of gaslighting and mind fucking. And um, next time, I think we're gonna go um, in a slightly different direction, but it's all the same. Um, I sure do appreciate your insight. Uh, if people are not familiar with Carolyn's work, I'd recommend look up Carolyn Baker on Amazon or any other place where you can get books and uh, you'll find many. And they're all extraordinarily valid to the point right now, to, the, to what we're facing right now. Or just go to and, my website at carolynbaker.net. Oh, thank you. Good. <laughs> And so um, until next time, uh, that's, uh, I'm Dean Walker, and I'm this Carolyn is, uh, what's that? I'm Carolyn Baker. And she's Carolyn Baker, and uh, we will see you again uh, in the very near future with another episode of uh, Gaslighting and Mindfucking for your entertainment and hopefully for your educational value. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Take care out there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. You may want to check out our sister podcasts, the new Lifeboat Hour with Carolyn Baker on Podbean and at carolynbaker.net. Also, the Impossible Conversation podcast, another channel on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us again later for another episode of The Poetry of Predicament.